Let's get down to the word of God this evening. Would you please turn with me for our opening reading. We're going to read quite a bit tonight for our opening reading to Daniel chapter 2, please. Daniel chapter 2. And let's start reading from verse 31. Daniel chapter 2, verse 31. Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. This image's head was of, of fine gold, his breast and arms of silver, his belly and thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Till thou, thou sawest, till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and break them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, the gold, broken to pieces together, and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away that no place was found for them and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth this is the dream and we will tell thee the interpretation thereof before the king thou o king art a king of kings for the god of heaven hath given thee a kingdom power strength and glory and wheresoever the children of men dwell the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven hath he given unto thine into thine hand and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces, and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. And the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay. So the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to another people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For as much as I saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron and the brass, the clay, the silver and the gold. The great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain on the interpretation thereof. Sure. We know the Lord will bless again the opening reading and all of the reading of his word, the saving. Let's just bow again in a word of prayer. Eternal Father, we just thank you and praise you. For your darling son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and we thank you for each and every person that you've brought here tonight to hear your word. Lord, whether it's through curiosity or, uh, Lord, whether it's just to strengthen their faith or whether, Lord, they have never heard these things before or many times. So tonight, Lord, we pray that your word would go forth in power. Lord, we believe that your word is eternal and your word will not return unto you void. And so, Father, tonight we pray that you would touch my frail lips, my clay lips, and Lord, that I may speak of your glory. And we pray, O oh God, that you take us and use us for your honor. We love you because you first loved us. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. You see, people say, and have asked me this week online, some in a polite way, some in not such a polite way, what has the Bible got to do with the European Union? Or what does the Bible, in other words, were to do with Brexit? Because it was on the flyer. And I think it's been uh, really uh, misconstrued what we were doing tonight. This isn't about Boris Johnson. It isn't about really Parliament. And it isn't about the backstop. And it isn't about all of those things. Yet all of those things are entailed in our day-to-day -day and our daily living. But this isn't what it's about. 
we're here tonight to show you that God had already told us to watch for these things and to watch what is happening in our nations tonight. There's a, an elitist power in the world and it's breaking the world up into segments and groupings to, be, to, to become eventually a, a new world order, a, a one world government. But tonight we are focusing on one part of that, which would be the part that affects us at this point in time the most, which is the European Union, especially when we're looking at Brexit, and whether it's going to happen, as people say, or it's not going to happen. But what we should do, and maybe by the time you leave here tonight, uh, my hope, my prayer would be that if there is a general election coming up, you'll be informed, even if you're a Christian, or whether you're not a Christian, you'll be informed that the spirit behind this, you'll see that it's not of God, but it is anti-Christ. And you'll see that before you leave. Now, when I say European Union, I'm not speaking of European people per se. I'm not speaking of individuals. If I speak of a certain faiths, I'm not speaking of individuals. I'm speaking of hierarchy. I'm speaking of leadership. I'm speaking of those who are, who are tethering the people and binding them for years and years. And at the end of it all, what we want you to see is that there is a, a salvation for each and every man and woman to be had. And it's only found in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the, that's the aim, that's the, the end goal and the finish of these meetings. We know we'll have another one in the Lord's will on the 17th of October. Nebuchadnezzar is the king of Babylon and he's had a dream and before we go further into this dream I want to just take a short reading a couple of verses from the book of Genesis the book of beginnings Genesis chapter 10 tells us about the beginning of this kingdom Genesis chapter 10 and verse 8 and Cush begot Nimrod he began to be a mighty one in the earth. Take note of that. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore, it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. Notice this, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. Babel and Babylon are synonymous in the scripture and in history. Babel is the beginning of the kingdom of Babylon. And Nimrod here, there is another name in ancient texts for him, and he's called Nimrod Hero. And that's where we get our name Hero from. He, he showed himself in the face of God, or Yahweh, Jehovah, that he was some sort of hero among men. And the sense that he was a hunter wasn't that he was a hunter-gatherer type of man, but rather, when you go into other readings like the Jerusalem Targum, which the Jews would read, you'll find that the Jerusalem Targum tells us that Nimrod, uh, being a hunter or mighty hunter before the Lord, it really means this, that Nimrod was a mighty hunter of men before the Lord. And those who would not come under his regime were hunted down and they were massacred and killed. Nimrod aimed for a one world government, a new world order. Look at chapter 11 for me. Verse 1, and the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. Notice the one language and one speech of the whole earth. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found the plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face, notice, of the whole earth. Unless we're divided, that is. And let's read on. Verse 5, And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do, now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. Very important to underline these and mark these sayings, that they may not understand 
one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. I notice here Nimrod, Babel, builds a tower, and they say, let us build a tower to heaven. Now, we're not really literally able to go into heaven. They build what is believed to be a ziggurat, a type of a pyramid ziggurat, going out in steps. And as they're building this, God comes down, and he sees the machinations of their heart. And when he sees the machinations of their heart, he not only destroys it, but he scatters them, and not only scatters them, but he also makes them that they cannot understand their language. He doesn't want them to be all one-worlders. Hope that makes sense from the very beginning. Now, Babel is the city. Babylon becomes the area. The Babylonians become the people. And in Daniel chapter 2 of our reading, we have Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away the southern kingdom of the house of Israel. The, the, of, called the house of Judah and they become known as the Jews and they're in Babylon now and you'll read of Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego in the fiery furnace and there you'll read of Daniel in the lion's den and so on and so on and here now in chapter 2 before that we have Nebuchadnezzar the king who has a dream and he calls his soothsayers and he says to his soothsayers tell me what I dreamt then tell me the interpretation tell me what I dreamt first of all then tell me the interpretation. Now, that's, all, that's impossible to men. But nevertheless, they couldn't. They were magicians and soothsayers. They were meant to know all the, the dark arts. What is known as the mystery cult of, of Babylonian religion. And they're meant to have known all these things, but they couldn't. So they realized this man, Daniel, has something special about him. Of course, Daniel was a child of God. And so they call for Daniel. Daniel then tells Nebuchadnezzar the dream. And then he tells him in our reading what he saw. Something before, I'm going to show you something in the PowerPoint and so before we go a little bit further. Whenever we speak of the kingdom of Babylon, where we are in Daniel chapter 2, will you mark that and go to Revelation, please, the very last book of the Bible. And you're going to find here, as we go through this, that Babylon lasts until the coming of the Lord again. That Babylon lasts until the coming of Christ. In Revelation chapter 17, we see the fall of Babylon. It actually starts in chapter 16, but let's just go into chapter 17. Then you'll find it falling further still in chapter 18. And let's just, for time's sake, let's just uh, go down to verse 4. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. When I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her. Notice this woman's on a beast. And the beast that carrieth her, which hath seven heads and ten horns. Now, God willing, we'll look at that in another way. So here we have, if you're reading the Bible, you have Daniel. And in Daniel chapter 12, almost at the end of the chapter, the Lord tells Daniel to shut up and seal up the book to the time of the end. And so when he gets all of these, uh, the, these prophecies and time scales, he closes the book. And when you get to the book of Revelation of Jesus Christ, then we find there that at the beginning of chapter 1, John on the Isle of Patmos, caught up in the spirit, he's told to open the book. So Daniel's told to shut it up. John is told to open it up. And what we're going to see is Daniel in Babylon. John now is seeing Babylon at the coming of Christ. But it changes. It morphs. And it becomes into a city as it were. As it's called or known. A city of three parts. 
Notice here in Daniel chapter 2, the dream. And let's just go down to verse 36 because it's from here that Daniel is interpreting the dream. And we'll show you what it, what it is. This is the dream and we will tell the, the, interpreta- tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, and the God of heaven hath given thee kingdom and power and strength and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of heaven, hath he given unto thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Now notice what he says to Nebuchadnezzar. Thou art this head of gold. Nebuchadnezzar sees a man, an image of a man in his dream with a head of gold. And then he says in verse 39, And after thee shall arise another kingdom, notice, inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron. So here is four kingdoms that are mentioned. So we have a time scale. We have from Nebuchadnezzar's day when he sees his dream, Babylonian kingdom. Then we have a silver kingdom, an inferior kingdom. And then we have a bronze or a brass kingdom. And then through time we have an iron kingdom. And then when we go on down again, it says of the iron kingdom, if you let your eye run down to verse 41, and whereas thou sawest the feet and the toes part of potter's clay, part of iron, and the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with merry clay. So here we have, he sees a figure of a man with a golden head, his chest and arms of silver, his belly of brass, his legs of iron, elongated, his legs of iron, and the feet had still some iron in it and had clay mixed with it. Notice then he says in verse 44, and in these days of the kings, notice, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. Now, what is that kingdom? Well, we've seen that Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. And that dream is a stone that's cut out without hands. Notice, it's a stone cut out without hands. In other words, it's not man-made. If it was man-made, it would be made of bricks, like Nimrod's tower. They made bricks of slime and mortar to build the tower. But this kingdom is not from Babel, not Babylonian, nor any of the kingdoms in this timeline, but rather, this will be a kingdom that is not made with hands. Now, I'm hoping I'm going to be able to use this. Oh, here we are. The gold is Nebuchadnezzar's Babylonian kingdom. Thou art this head of gold, he says. Next you'll see that there is a kingdom that comes along, and you'll find this, if you're taking notes, you'll find this, it happens in Daniel chapter 5. Daniel chapter 5, we have Belshazzar's feast when he brings all the, all the artifacts and the furniture in from the tabernacle, or pardon me, from the temple that was in Jerusalem, and they sacked Jerusalem and brought the house of Judah into Babylon from it. And there they start messing around with those, uh, those things, those holy things of God, and there's a handwriting on the wall, meaning, meaning, tell you, Farson, and really it's saying your kingdom hath been numbered, and where in the balances you're found wanting, and that night, we find that Belshazzar in his feast, he was uh, taken away from being the king of Babylon and the inferior kingdom, the inferior kingdom of silver, the, uh, the chest of arms uh, of silver, it took over. Two arms speaks of the Medo-Persian kingdom, the Medes and the Persians, okay? The Medes and the Persians were the two arms of silver, And then, whenever you read that, you'll find in Daniel chapter 5, Belshazzar is Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, if my calculations are right. And so it's a time scale going down. The Medo-Persians come in. We have Darius, the, uh, the Mede, Cyrus, the Persian. And it's Cyrus who then writes the decree in later years, after the 70 years, for to release the house of Judah or the Jews to go back into Jerusalem to build the walls and the temple from which Christ would come from. So that's all in the silver kingdom. And then after that, down through time, the third kingdom is of bronze, the Grecian Empire, and it is Alexander the Great, the great Grecian warrior. 
and from the, uh, the, the Adriatic Sea to the Indus River, right out in the east into India, right down into North Africa and across the whole of the northern uh, Mediterranean, round the Baltics, the whole way through over the Holy Lands, over the Holy, Holy Land and right into Babylon and so on. He took over that. That's why I said it covers the whole earth. It's the known earth, as it were, in that time. And so he, that is the next kingdom of Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great was only, I think, about 32 when he died. Maybe 33. 32, I think, when he died. And Alexander the Great not only died at, at a young age, but within 10 years, he conquered all of those kingdoms. Uh, very, very fast. Very, very powerful. And then after that, we have the Iron Kingdom, which was the Roman Empire, the Caesars of Rome. This is the time when the Lord Jesus comes in. This is the time when Jesus stands before Pontius Pilate. And then the early church's birth, the day of Pentecost. And this is whenever they're, uh, then they go through ten main periods of, of uh, major persecution uh, through ten Roman Caesars. And then we, of course, we have then the toes of iron and clay. Where does that bring us to? Well, there's a change happens because of this iron kingdom. Herein is the change. The Roman Caesar empire fails. We'll talk about it more in detail in a moment. It fails. And it fails because of some Gothic, ten Gothic uh, tribes mainly that are around Italy and Europe at the time, they attack the Roman Empire. And when they attack the Roman Empire, what happens is the uh, Romans are right up to uh, Scotland's uh, border, right up to where Hadrian's Wall is today, still standing. And so the Romans, they call their troops home. They have enough troops at home, too much trouble at home, and of course they fall. What happens? It's a deadly wound that we read in the Scripture. And then from the deadly wound that arises again like a miraculous rising, what happens? A papal Rome comes out of it. And then, of course, from there, we have not only from the papal Rome, we have then the allegiance with the Holy Roman Emperor, which would be Charlemagne in 800 AD on Christmas Day. On Christmas Day, he was crowned the Holy Roman Emperor by Pope Leo III. And so he was the military wing, and the papacy was the uh, uh, ecclesiastical wing, if you want. That was behind all of it. All of this links us right into, remember, it has to be still standing until Christ comes again. The stone kingdom will come. It hits the image on its feet, and we're told the gold and the silver and the bronze and the iron and the feet being hit are all the trait of the man is all hit together, and we're told that it collapses at the end. Now, why am I telling you all of that up front? I'm going to show you it from another perspective. Then I'm going to touch on Revelation, and if you are happy enough tonight, and you keep it in mind, on the 17th of October, God willing, we'll be back, look more into the book of Revelation, and bring us right in to what God has done in recent years uh, for us. When Rome called their troops home, that is pagan Rome, and they were defending before the collapse of Rome with Romulus Augustus was the last Caesar. When they called the troops home 16 years later before the collapse of the Roman Empire. Okay? So they weren't in Britain. Now notice this is a type. We have types in the Bible. This is a type. They weren't in Britain at the time of the Roman Empire collapsing. Why am I saying that? Because if Britain comes out, the Bible tells us the Roman Empire, i.e. the Babylonian Empire, is going to collapse, which is nowadays modern European Union. And as it collapses, Britain should be out of it, just as it was then, before the collapse comes. How do we know it's going to collapse? Well, in Revelation 17, we read about the harlot riding the beast. We're going to look at it. In Revelation uh, 16 it starts and then into 17 and into chapter 18 you can read it when you go home and it's Babylon you'll find political you have Babylon economical and Babylon religious one world government new world order being fashioned and then we read that it turns they turn actually on the whore or the woman on the Roman church 
And that's what's happening today. That's why it's dwindling. Because now it's becoming secularized. And it's becoming hated itself too. But yet it's still religiously trying to gather other nations, or pardon me, other religions around it. Stay with me while we go on here. Will you turn with me, please, to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. Verse 1. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream. Now notice this is Daniel's dream. The first one was Nebuchadnezzar's dream, which Daniel interpreted. Now Daniel's having a dream. Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven strove upon the great sea. And the four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. The first was like, notice the symbology here, because this carries into the book of Revelation, chapter 13. Notice this. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. And I beheld until the wings thereof were plucked. And it was lifted up from, from the earth and made the stand upon the feet, the feet as a man, and as a man's heart was given to it. Behold, another beast, a second like to a bear, and it raised up itself on one side and had three ribs in the mouth of it between the teeth of it. And they, thus, they said thus to it, Arise and devour much flesh. And after this I beheld, and lo, another like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I saw the night visions and behold a fourth beast notice dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly and it had great iron teeth notice the, the iron teeth like the iron in Daniel 2 it devoured and break in pieces and stopped the, stomped the residue with the feet of it and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it and it had ten horns I considered the horns and behold there came up among them another little horn before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. And I beheld until the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and his hair, hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wings like a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth, from before him, thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were open. I beheld then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake. I beheld even till the beast was slain, and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away. Yet their lives were prolonged for a season time. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom it shall not be destroyed. Notice here he sees four beasts. These four beasts correspond with Nebuchadnezzar's dream in Daniel chapter 2. You might say, why do I need to know all this? I'm building up a picture for you and I'm going to go further into this. That if I build this picture up, you'll see, because I'm bringing you from ancient Babylon, mystery religions and everything that's in it. And why, when I look at the European Union... I'm not talking about all the European people. I'm talking about all the politicians. I'm talking about a political elitist. I'm talking about one worldism bankers. I'm talking about all of this. It goes far, far greater than this. This is talking about Europe's side of it only at the moment. And for you to know that maybe you're going to vote. I can't tell you how to vote. But maybe you'll think about this and say, well, what spirit is behind this? Maybe I was a Christian and I thought this was a good thing. Well, you'll make your mind up. 
at that day then maybe differently. Notice this. Babylon is the head of gold and now it is seen as a lion with wings. And it devours. This is the, the Babylonian kingdom, this strong and mighty kingdom. And the wings, in fact, uh, uh, throughout scripture, and I haven't time to go into it, in fact, if you want to know more in a, in a far more detailed DVD, we, Glenn, where are you? We have DVDs. If you go out and down the stairs, uh, there's DVDs there, and there's also gospel DVDs just for playing gospel preaching on them for, to give to unsaved loved ones or workmates. There's DVDs there, and there's also Nebuchadnezzar's dreams are there, and teachings we've done in these, and they're free. You can take them. The idea is that we're not charging anything. We want to get the word out. We want people to be informed. And so this head of gold is the Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian kingdom. That equals the lion. Why is there these beasts instead of the irons and the metals? Because, you see, man sees himself as glorious. Man sees himself as wonderful. Man sees himself as fine and okay, but really the Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. The Bible tells us for all of sin and come short of the glory of God. So the Bible tells us that every one of us needs saved, no matter whether, whatever side of the divide or religion we come from. The Bible says that we must be born again to enter into Christ's kingdom and into his kingdom. And so the Lord shows Daniel what he thinks of Babylon and the subsequent kingdoms right through spiritually, political, and economical. Not only in Europe, but around the world. And you see the, the Marxist, the, 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 the social uh, Marxist uh, uh, ideology that's around the world today. Surely you can see uh, the depravity that's gathering in the nations and around the world. So it, it goes further than just the European Union. Notice, then we have the bear. The bear, we're told, is lopsided. I'm just skipping over these, and you can get them in detail, as I said, if you'd like a DVD. And the bear is lopsided. In other words, he's up on one side. Why? Remember the man with the two arms of silver, Medes and the Persians? What happened was Darius the Mede, he had prominence in the kingdom. This was a, a dual confederacy of these two kings. He had prominence. And so because he had prominence, we read of him. And then, of course, he starts to diminish. And Cyrus, pardon me, the king, he then tends to take over who released uh, the, the people to go back to Jerusalem. Notice, so it's lopsided. It's lopsided kingdom. There are three ribs in his mouth. Without getting into it very quickly, one stands for Egypt, one for the nation of Babylon, and the other one is for Lydia. And they were the first ones that went in and it tore them out like a ravenous beast. Through history and in battle, that's what it did. And this is all told in the Bible before it happened. Remember, we're looking back at it but this was told in the Bible before it happened. And so then we have the bear of Medo-Persia, the silver. We have the bronze, which is Greece. And you'll see it's a leopard. Remember I told you about Alexander the Great, the great Grecian emperor from uh, the Adriatic Sea right through to the Indus River in India and off North Africa and all of that uh, continent of all around the Mediterranean and into the Middle East. Conquered it with speed, like the leopard, with power like a leopard. And so he's likened onto a leopard. Within 10 years, this young man conquered all of this area. What's the four wings of a fowl for? Well, the four wings of a fowl are for uh, four provinces. What's the four heads for? Four generals. When he died, that is, uh, uh, when Alexander the Great died, his kingdom was divided into four provinces and given to four generals. Now, if I can remember their names, Lysimachus, Ptolemy, Seleucid, and uh, it'll come to me, the fourth one. And they all had four provinces between them. And in those provinces, then, those, those, uh, they started going diverse one from another. What happens? The iron comes and the man but notice here, I know there's a picture like a dinosaur there. I don't know who drew that. But it, it's just meant to be a beast. But notice it isn't an animal that you and I can recognize like a lion. It's not an animal like a leopard either or a bear. 
It's a beast that's diverse or different than all the others. It's indescribable. And the reason that being is because it takes on a format that people will hardly recognize. But it's vicious. It's vicious. And notice this. This is not only pagan Rome, but with the legs of iron continuing on into the, into the clay and the iron toes and feet, it continues on. When? Until Daniel says, until chapter 7. He says, until verse 9, I beheld the thrones were cast down, and the ancients of days did sit, whose garment was white as snow. And then he says, in verse 11, I beheld then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake. What is that horn? I've already told you about that horn. I don't want to try to make this too complicated now. I don't want to, it's the deadly wound that we talked about of the pagan Roman emperor. And then from that comes the papal Roman emperor. And the horn that rises up was the papacy that came out of it. Okay? Now, I'm going to reverse you back a little. I'm bringing you closer into the European Union for a moment, and then we'll go further in. Remember we talked about Nimrod? In the Babel, in the Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, and then we go to the Medo-Persians, then we go to Alexander the Great, then we go to the Roman Caesars, and then we go into the legs, right through into the toes. We have the, the papal system, then we have all the false religions of the world. Nimrod, hero, this man who was the mighty hunter of men, okay? This man, Nimrod, had a wife called Samaramas. Samaramas was a wicked woman. And Samaramas, um, when her husband Nimrod died, she had the people of Babel worship Nimrod, said that the sun in the sky was Nimrod the God. Okay? Nimrod the God. And so what actually happened was, because she says that he was Nimrod the God, people started to worship the sun, the S-U-N. She fell... Uh, pregnant with a child. She had a, 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 a boy and his name was Tammuz. And we even find in Babylon through other writings that the Jews worship Tammuz. They even had a, have a, a, a part of their calendar. One of the months is called Tammuz. Because it, they, they're mingled in Babylon together. And when Jesus comes, he said to them, to, he said to many of them, you're off their father the devil because you're not looking after the things of God but rather those traditions. That's what he's talking about. And so this woman, she has a baby called Tammuz. And she says that it's Nimrod incarnate. And so what she does is she has people walk through coals of fire. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? She has people walk through coals of fire. And this is then, what you would have is a father of the son, if you want, an ungodly or an antichrist trinity. You have a father, you have a mother in worship, you have a son, and you have the fire of Nimrod, which is the Holy Ghost, so-called. And so what you also have then is because she has them worshipping the sun in the sky, and then she has them worshipping Nimrod incarnate in the sun, Tammuz, she starts off what's known as the cult of the cult of the mother and child. And so they have mother and child worship. Semiramis is known then. This mystery cult of religion spreads. Semiramis becomes known in different countries under different names. For example, the Greeks called her Aphrodite. Uh, the Egyptians called her Osiris. And the Phoenicians, you ready, called her Europa. They called her Europa. Now, Nimrod, his name became known as other names too. For example, many of the later Germanic tribes, they actually worshipped Thor. And that was another word for Nimrod. We have uh, the god Jupiter in Rome. That's Nimrod. But do you know what the Greeks, God's uh, equivalent of Nimrod was? Zeus. Zeus. Now, here's the story uh, that, uh, about this. The story is, is that Zeus, the so-called God, when I say God, we know there's only one God. Isn't that right? Yeah. One God, the Lord God of heaven and earth, the, the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that right? There's only one God. 
But when I say God, you understand what I mean. I'm talking about these false gods that they worship. It's behind it. The spirit that's behind these. These are demonic spirits behind it. And Zeus uh, disguises himself as a, a bull or a beast. And he comes to Phoenicia. Now Phoenicia is on the, the Mediterranean side of the land of Israel. The Phoenician prophetesses, or if you want priestesses I should say, they had around their garments a, a design, a lovely design. And when you looked at it closer, it was a swastika. Swastika, uh, we know it as a, a Nazi symbol. But way before that, it's in Hinduism. They worship at the swastika. Buddhism used the swastika. Jainism worship at the swastika. Shintoism used the swastika. Way before the, Ger or the Nazis did. And so the swastika, if you can picture it in your head, it gives the idea of something that would turn or roll over. It's meant to be a rolling sun. You getting the connection now? You getting the sun god, the rolling sun. And it was meant to be for good luck, good fortune. And so these priestesses wore it. This woman, uh, Europa, would have then, in mythology, worn one of these. For example, the Buddhists believe the swastika is a sign of Buddhist footprints. The Greeks, ancient Greeks, believed the swastika was a sign, you ready, of Zeus. And his mark upon his people. I hope you're with me here. So the thing about this is, is this Zeus so-called God makes himself into a beast or an animal. He comes and he places Europa. He, he, he woos her. She decides, wouldn't this be lovely? This is in their mythology to get her right on the back of him. And he gets her on his back and he takes her to Crete. Then, of course, into Greece. And Europa's name comes in two parts, Euros, Euris and Op. And Euris means the broad face off, and Op means to see, as in ophthalmic, opticians, and so on, eyes to see. And so Euris means the broad face off. It gives the idea, remember the bull, but it also gives the idea of a bull with a wide head with two big eyes. In other words, you can see across the broad face. That's the idea of it. So when Europa is put on the Zeus back, Zeus takes her to Greece, and thus comes the name with, uh, with her as being a priestess, she becomes known, or it becomes known after her, Europe. That's where it comes from. Now you might say, how do I know this? Let me show you something if I can find this. I've went off my notes. Do you know that? I haven't used a note yet. Hold on a second. I wanna, I've got photographs and I don't know where I am. Okay, sun worship. Well, I wasn't going to go there, but we'll go there now. See, if we lay the man down, there's the head of gold as a Babylon. Chest of arms and silver, all around that Babylon, Medio Persian area. There he is, the kingdom of bronze. That would be where Greece is. If you put him that way there again, there's the legs of iron and the feet of iron and clay. They actually stretch right into Europe. That's the way it would go. Coming west. And Israel were scattered and went west. And it followed them. Notice this. Notice this. Talk about sun worship. I'll just have to flick through these to find them then. There we are. Sun worship. Tammuz is the star. Semiramis becomes the moon goddess. Nimrod's wife. Nimrod is the sun. Can you see it? Let's look at another one, will we? Look, there's all different religions using it. Mother and child worship. You see where we are. Look. See the bull? It's all taken from forms of worship. Now stay with me to see this. Sun wafer was lifted to Nimrod and through Babylonia. Starbursts, sunbursts. It's all through. I took this photograph myself. I had the pleasure of going to Tenerife a few months ago. No, it wasn't Tenerife. Where was it? Tormelinus. Where's my wife? Wasn't it? 
I can tell you about this, but I couldn't tell you where I was myself. <laughs> this is, has anybody seen this, been in Tormelinus and seen this? A few have seen this. I took these photographs. You'll just about see, oh, see here? Crown of stars, circle of stars in her hand. Can you see it? And this is Europa, and here's the bull of Zeus. Let me read this to you if I can. Numerous were seductions of Zeus, God supreme of Olympus, the father of all men, born to Telephassa, wife of Agenor, king of Tyre. Now if you look at Ezekiel 28 when you go home, you'll find the Lord speaks unto the king of Tyre. This is in Phoenicia. Looks unto the king of Tyre and he says, Thou wast in Eden, the garden of God. Then he starts to describe him, speaking to the king, but he's speaking to Satan behind him. He says, Thou wast in Eden, the garden of God. Read it when you go home, in Ezekiel 28. And notice here, it says, The king of Tyre was a princess called Europa, who one day, playing with her friends by the seashore of Sidon, was observed by Zeus, who captivated her beauty and lusted for her. Fearing rejection, Zeus assumed the guise of a beautiful, majestic white bull, a great creature, laying himself down before Europa, lowered his head gently to entice her. The other girls fled, but Europa was not frightened and fascinated by the gentle, lulling movements of Zeus. She drew near, patted him, and even dared to climb on his back. The bull took off and dived into the sea and sped away across the oceans with her astride, despite the young girl's beseeching wails. Zeus and Europa arrived on the island of Crete, where he reveled, revealed his true identity there, close to a fountain not far from Gortnia. He seduced Europa under the shade of a banana tree, which in popular belief received the privilege of never losing their leaves for having marked the scene of the amorous amours of Zeus and Europa. And so... The abduction of Europa was consummated after her death. She received divine honors. Notice she received divine honors. There's it there. And in remembrance of his love of Europa, Zeus placed the shape of a great white bull in the sky, the constellation of Taurus, one of the signs of the zodiac. Europa conferred her name to the continent that for 2,500 years has led the culture and development of humanity. And that in 2004 in the figure of European Union, has achieved for the first time in human, human history the conscious and exemplary political and economic alliance between 25 different countries of the most... What does that say? Heterogeneous customs, races and religions inaugurated by the Honorable Pedro Fernandez. Mayor of Tormelinus, 2005. Can you see that? I can't see it. <laughs> I'll get you up closer and you can watch it later. This is in Tormelinus. So it's right in front of us. It's hidden in plain sight. There's a European Union stamp for you. That's in Brussels. That's outside the government buildings. There's a European Union two euro coin. It's Time Magazine put that up. So, these kingdoms are to last until Jesus returns. There's a stone kingdom that is cut out without hands. It's not made of man, but rather it's of God. And so what happens is it comes and it smashes the man's image. That is, European Union of defeat. And we find in Revelation chapter 16, Revelation chapter 17, Revelation chapter 18, we find that these nations are pulled down. How are we doing for time? We're okay yet. Folks, would you turn with me as well?
to Revelation chapter 13, please. Revelation 13. Revelation 13 and verse 1. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. And upon his head, horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the names of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto, notice, what is it like? A leopard. And his feet were as the feet of a bear. And his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave unto him his power, his seat, and his authority. And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death. That's what we've seen. The pagan Roman Empire. And his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wandered after the beast. Here is the rising of the people. And they worshipped the dragon and gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And the power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth and blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle. And them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints. And to overcome them, and power was given unto him over all kindreds and tongues and nations, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life, pardon me, the, in the book of the life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So notice here, there's ten crowns, there was ten toes, iron and clay. There were teeth of iron, but now there's ten crowns. There's a lamb, there's the bear, there's the leopard from Daniel. Remember, Daniel, shut it up. Revelation says, open it up and show the people. And this is what we're seeing today. Let me just go a little further with you, if I can. So this is Charlemagne, king of the Franks, being crowned. The Holy Roman Emperor, this is a painting of it by Pope Leo III in 800 AD on Christmas Day. On Christmas Day. This is a coin that was struck up in 1580 by Philip II of Spain. Philip II of Spain then took over the New Reich. That's what it's called, the Reich. He took over the New Reich. And Philip II of Spain sent out the Spanish Armada to try and draw Britain. Britain is known as Mary's Diary. To try and draw Britain back in again. You see why there's a fight to keep us in. So here we have the flag that everyone, I'm sure, is well aware of and knows. The flag of the European Union. Notice this. Remember the woman on the beast? Remember that? Turn to Revelation chapter 12 with me, please. Revelation 12, verse 1. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, behold, a great red dragon having seven heads, notice, ten horns and the seven crowns upon his heads and his tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth and the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon it was, as it was born and she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne and the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. Now, when you read on there, it tells you that the dragon is the same dragon in Revelation 13 who gives the power is the same one in Revelation 12 who's fighting against the angels of God. That's Satan. Okay? The woman here has a crown of stars in Revelation 12. The sun 
and the moon. Remember we're talking about the sun and the moon? So automatically people say, ah, you see, this must be Babylon. No, it isn't. And in many cases, I don't know if, if they all said, but some say it was uh, the church. It's not the church. Some say it was the Roman Catholic Church. In fact, the Roman Catholics say, here we are. No, it's not. Genesis chapter 37 tells us of Joseph coming to his father Jacob and saying uh, that he had a dream. And he had 12 stars and the sun and the moon. The 11 stars, which were his 11 brothers, 12 sons for 12 tribes, would bow down and worship his star. And the sun was Jacob and Jacob Israel and the moon was his mother. And Jacob says, shall I and your mother and your brothers fall down before you? And so Israel is the woman who was scattered in the wilderness here in Revelation chapter 12. Israel brings forth the woman. The church didn't, pardon me, Israel brings forth the child. The woman Israel, not the church. Christ brought forth his church, isn't that right? The church didn't bring forth Christ. So what scattered Israel? Now notice. So what is this blue background? I'm going to check my time because I'm going to, oh, I'm all right there. So the blue background comes from what's known as the, the blue apostolate of Mary. There was a big happening in 1917, just over 102 years, or coming 102 years ago. The seven times punishment of the house of Judah was over. Jerusalem was liberated from Turkish Ottoman Empire, just as the Lord had said it. Um, it's known as the seven times punishment from there. We're carried away here in Babylon. Remember the head of gold where Daniel is? And it's 2,520 years. It brings us right to the year 1917. 1917, Jerusalem was liberated by General Allenby, a British general, Australian troops, and they flew little by wing planes over Jerusalem without a bomb being dropped, without a shot being fired. Jerusalem was liberated from the Turkish Ottoman Empire. In the same year, 1917, the Bolshevik Revolution took hold. And millions of Christians, millions of them, were killed by Bolsheviks. Millions of them. We don't hear much about it. There was a man called Mao Zedong. Mao Zedong took the teachings from the Bolsheviks, from the Marxist agenda, which you're now seeing in our nation, in our governments. You're now seeing it in the lobbyist groups. You're seeing it in many of our political parties, in the Greens and the all so on. That Marxist agenda was taken to what's known as the People's Republic of China. There was a war with the Chinese. The Chinese moved to Taiwan. The, the, that is, the, the Chinese um, uh, nationalists moved to Taiwan because they were beaten back because of this communism that was taken over, this Marxist agenda. And so Mao Zedong, he took this in 1917, and that's where that started. And so today you have America with Taiwan, because they moved to Taiwan. The, the Chinese Republic, is, or pardon me, nationalists moved to Taiwan. And so you have America still back in Taiwan, and they even moved around towards the Philippines, and that's why they're there. That's in 1917. Also in 1917 in Portugal, in no other place but a place called Fatima. There was the vision of what's known as the three Hebrew, Hebrew, pardon me, shepherd children. Three shepherd children. He says they saw visions of Mary, who showed them a sign to say, consecrate Russia to my immaculate heart. And war started with Russia. 70,000 people went to see a vision of the sun standing still. That's what they're told. Remember the sun? The S-U-N. 70,000 men. You can see the old photographs if you look it up. Poor people, sincere. Probably good people. Being lost and brought to hell. And notice this, 1917, from there started Mary's apostate uh, army, or the blue army you called it. The blue background there it is. The stars. That's where it's from. 
There's a one word government for you of, of religious system. Archbishop of Canterbury. All the different faith religions. Some say, is that not a good thing? This is what the Lord warned us against. Remember Babylon? He separated them. This is what the Lord warned us against. I'll come back to that. I think I've lost a picture. So this is a, this is a, a picture that was taken from an artist's impression. Notice the stars? But notice where they are? They're inverted. You see that? And look what it says here. Europe, many tongues, one voice. What did the Lord say? Scatter them in no voice. Can't understand each other. Europe's bringing them back into what? They're trying to undo what God had done. Tower of Babel. That's what that stands for, the Tower of Babel. Europe, many tongues, one voice. And here's your building. And if you count these, there's actually ten. Like ten toes. Like ten horns. Like ten crowns. And this is modeled on this. And outside of this is a woman riding a beast. I'm trusting this is opening your eyes a bit if there comes a, an election. That you'll tell people as well and let them know. So what we have, I'm coming to a close. Thank you for your attention. So what we have here is the European Union, and let me just read you out some dates. This is the first I've looked at my notes, now I'm lost. Notice this. In 1945, the Pope launched the Christian Democratic Party. If you're wondering, the party that's like Angela Merkel now is in it, although she's Anglican, but that's that party. In 1950, Jean Monnet and he Paul Henry Speck, they were devout Roman Catholics, and they uh, started the Euro European iron, steel, and coal industry. And their words were, together, together, a re-Catholicized Europe. In 1957, we had the EEC, Common Market. And where was it settled? In, it was known as the Treaty of Rome. In 1973, Edward Heath signed a treaty with death, a covenant of death, as the Lord tells us in Isaiah 28, I think. Edward Heath signs a treaty, and he lies telling the people that there's no threat to Britain's sovereignty. Look where we are. In 1990, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, the Soviet bloc enters in. Pope John Paul said that the Eastern European bloc, you ready, was the other lung of Europe and of the Church of Rome. You had the Western bloc, and with the fall of it came the Eastern bloc. The man with iron legs and feet has two of them. It also happened when the, the, the there was a split with Constantinople and Rome were actually arguing at one time, the two popes at one time actually. Uh, 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 that's another story for another time. But two legs, and they're separated again. Notice this. In 1992, we had the Maastricht Treaty, or in other words, it came known as the European Union. And pope, the Pope canonized the founders of the iron, steel, and coal industry. He canonized them for it. The Lisbon Treaty affects Britain politically, commercially, economically, and now militarily. Ten years ago, I preached on this. In fact, four, 15 years ago, I preached on this in Dublin. And I've still a lot of friends in Dublin. Preached on it in Dublin to tell them that when these come around to get out, 19, 2008, I'm, losing, I'm losing my years, I'm 10 years away. 2008, we had the, the Lisbon Treaty. Holland, the Czech Republic, and the Republic of Ireland all refused it whenever they put it to the people. 
the European Union, the Celtic Tiger was up, was booming all these years up to 2008. They refused it. Suddenly the Celtic Tiger disappeared. And in 2009, the people were told you didn't know what you were voting for. People were told that they were stupid. The people, the people of the Republic of Ireland were told, as if the people didn't know what they were saying themselves. Told they were stupid. And they were told, must try harder, vote again until it went through. Sound familiar? 2009. You see, the monetary system stopped until they brought it in. We're hearing a lot of scaremonger tactics. Notice the European EU law enforcement police force came into being. The European army uh, is now gathering. Remember, Britain done away with a lot of its defences to join with France. You know why? Because France was one of the leading lights in Europe. And now it's France that won't let Britain go after Britain delivering France from Nazi power. The EU monetary system, the euro, is trying to gather all in. Let me finish with this. The crown of thorn, or thorns, pardon me, the crown of stars that we've seen. The European Union has a nice national anthem, but you don't hear it. But it's selling ready. It's got the tune. It's got the words. Remember Europa? It's, it's spoken, the national anthem is sung to Beethoven's Ninth Symphony music called Ode to Joy. I'm going to read just a verse or so off it. You ready? Joyful spark of hope and glory. Unity with the divine. Drunken under fire. Goddess, we approach thy holy shrine. Thy magic shall unite forever those nations th that which were not. Every mortal becomes one, and your rule shall not be forgot. And that's the European Union anthem that they want us to sing. The king is coming. The stone kingdom cut out without hands is coming. There's a monetary system goes worldwide with the, the bankers, Bilderbergers, and all of these groupings, the Trilateral Commission. You'll hear of all them. It's all one word. It's all one word. The Club of Rome, Bilderberger Group, United Nations, Council of Foreign Relations, Trilateral Commission, Royal Institute of Affairs. You'll see all of that, and that's all one world, isn't it? All from different groupings, different nations, different religions, all brought together to bring us into a unified one world order. But we're looking at the European Union tonight. Let me finish with this. There's a stone kingdom coming, and that's the kingdom of God. Christ will return again. And this is going to be smashed to pieces. He's going to come and set up his kingdom and rule and reign from Jerusalem. And when Christ returns, there's only one of two places you can be, friend. Either with Christ, which is far better, or at the judgment seat of the great white throne on a lake of fire. Revelation chapter 20 tells us of this beast and all goes into a lake of fire. And all those who are not written in the book of life, see, Christ came that he would die for your sins. He came to shed his blood for you because, you see, as I said earlier on, all of us, no matter who you are, what religion you're from, all of us are sinners. All of us have failed. All of us have come short of the glory of God. All of us have Adam's germs and genes in us. And all of us must repent of our sins and go on to know the Lord. Go on to follow Christ. Jesus only, by the way, not Jesus plus. But what Christ has done on the cross, that he died for our sins, that he shed his blood, that his blood alone cleanses us from all our sin, and that we must take his righteousness, not our works. It's not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us, Paul says. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God and not of works, lest anyone should boast. 
So we have no boasting to do no matter who we are, no matter what way we grew up, no matter what religion we have come from. The only thing we can boast in is what Christ has done on the cross in the shedding of his precious blood. So are you saved tonight? Have you repented of your sin? Should this be the time when all of this is happening? Why teach this that people would vote right? Well, it's up to you. I teach this because I want people to know the day and the hour that we're living in. And if Christ was to come, are you ready or will you be lost? It doesn't matter. You could say, well, I'm a good Protestant and oh, I, go and I, I, go, I go to the barns and all. You know, I do all this stuff. You can do that all you want and you'll still be lost. Are you saved? Have you been to the cross? Have you been to Christ? Are you born again? Are you washed by faith in the blood of Christ? Are you trusting in him only, solely, uniquely, totally and completely, and in no one and in nothing else? Because it's only there that a man and a woman can be saved. Christ alone. It's not Jesus plus my church. It's not Jesus plus my religion. It's not Jesus plus my denomination or my good works. It's believing that Christ died for you. Shed his blood for you. And that alone is sufficient to cleanse you of all of your sin. Receiving Christ as your Lord. Being ready. You know what happens? He takes your sin, the penalty of your sin, and he gives you his righteousness. And he's not going to ask you, are you a Roman Catholic? And he's not going to ask you, are you a Protestant? Or are you a nationalist? Are you a loyalist? He's not going to ask you that. He's not going to ask you, did you come to the town hall and listen? He's not going to ask you, did you go to Christ Encounters Tabernacle, where we are? He's not going to ask you where, where you go to, where you fellowship. You know what you're going to be asked by God on that day? What have you done with my son? He died for you. Did you accept him? Did you believe in him? Did you trust him? That's what you're going to be asked, and that's what you'll stand or fall on. If you have trusted him, you'll be saved. And if you haven't trusted him, then you're lost. But you can know tonight, friend, Right this very moment in your seat, you can know tonight whether you're going to be in heaven or hell. A man once said to me, oh, you're not know you get there. No, friend, I can tell you. I know tonight, not because of me, but because of Jesus, that should I drop here in this spot, I'm going to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Are you assured of it? Are you saved? Are you forgiven? Would you see some of us tonight before you go home? Say, I'm not ready. I must be born again. I, I know I need to get saved. If you're not saved and you're not ready, you will not be in the kingdom of God. Friends, brothers and sisters, I trust tonight it's been beneficial for you to come. I trust tonight that you've reaped there and gleaned something from that you've heard tonight. That's maybe even helped you, maybe settle something in your mind. But friend, if you're not saved, I trust tonight you'll get saved tonight. You might be saying, what must I do to be saved? Well, let me tell you what Paul said to a Philippian jailer. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Oh, I believe. Then come and see us. And we'll talk to you about it. We would love you to come back again on October the 17th. I'm going to do something, a little bit of that, to spring us into somewhere else. And maybe if you have even enjoyed tonight, that you'll say to others, come back on the 17th. And that's full the house. I want to thank you for your attendance. I want to thank you for your attention. I want to thank you for coming. And may God richly bless each and every one of you.